Hello, I'm Dr. Kathleen Rogers, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining the CMEO cast entitled How to Use Digital Cognitive Testing Tools to Aid in the Diagnosis of Mild Cognitive Impairment and Dementia. This activity is supported by an educational grant from BrainCheck. I am the Chief of Service in Geriatric Medicine at Cleveland Clinic, Akron General in Stowe, Ohio. Our learning objectives for today, today's activities is to integrate digital cognitive um, testing tools into clinical workflow to aid in the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment and dementia. Let's start by defining mild cognitive impairment or MCI. MCI is a condition in which individuals demonstrate focal or multifocal impairment um, with minimal impairment to activities, uh, instrumental activities of daily living that does not cross the threshold for dementia diagnosis. Oftentimes, patients present to their PCPs or other providers noting a change to their higher level of functioning most mostly in their IA deals or instrumental activities of daily living, examples uh, including um, getting lost while driving, balancing their finances, etc. And mild cognitive impairment or MCI can be the first cognitive expression of Alzheimer's disease. And it also can be secondary to other disease processes that can cause reversible cognitive deficits. It is important to remember that MCI or mild cognitive impairment can present predominantly with memory dysfunction or of other uh, impairment of other cognitive domains, uh, such as language, executive function, and visual spatial deficits. Here we see that Gillis et al. Um, noted a wide variance of heterogeneity in detection of MCI across the board across specialties, as well as primary care settings, likely reflecting differences in population and methods. The prevalence of undetected dementia is as high as 61.7% globally, and 40 to 60% of individuals over age 58 have underlying Alzheimer's disease pathology. So wide variations in detecting dementia need to be urgently examined, particularly in populations with low economic status. As you can see here, there are early symptomatic phases of Alzheimer's disease. MCI due to Alzheimer's disease or mild Alzheimer's disease dementia is not to be confused with early onset Alzheimer's disease. As you see the spectrum in preclinical or asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease, there are no symptoms reported or noted by caregivers or family. In early Alzheimer's disease, um, you may have a patient present to you in the clinic um, with very mild symptoms, uh, tentative forgetfulness occasionally from time to time that is now different from their baseline, or it starts to act, uh, interfere with daily activities. As you move across the spectrum, you will notice that there are symptoms that interfere with many activities of daily living, and then with severe dementia, with most activities of daily living and um, basic activities, including grooming and um, hygiene, feeding, walking, continence, etc. Everyone experiences slight cognitive changes during aging, but how do we differentiate them? There is cognitive decline that can be preclinical, as we see in this graph. Preclinical, also known as the silent phase, where you do not have measurable signs on testing um, or recordable signs on testing. Uh, there are changes without symptoms or signs. Um, the individual may detect uh, personal changes, but the tests usually measure normal. A stage where the patient knows, but the doctor doesn't is a very good way of placing um, this stage. The next stage is MCI or mild cognitive impairment where the cognitive changes are measurable and are often brought to the primary care provider or other providers um, by the family um, or the individual. One or more cognitive domains may be impaired, but there's pre preserved activities of daily living. 
The difference between MCI and dementia is when the cognitive impairment does interfere with everyday activities and basic activities such as grooming and cleaning and hygiene, for example. Current evidence shows that the initiating event of an Alzheimer's disease is related to abnormal processing of beta amyloid uh, peptide, ultimately leading to the formation of beta amyloid plaques in the brain. This process occurs while individuals are still cognitively normal, as we saw previously. As you can see here, the orange line shows the beta amyloid plaques in the brain that start to increase while the patient is cognitively normal. Um, these formation of plaques plateau and thus you will note that MCI then presents itself to the patient clinically um, and um, uh, to their providers. But this poses a challenge. At what point do we begin to initiate the detection of memory loss? Current diagnosis poses a slew of challenges, such as difficulty differentiating from normal aging, normal forgetfulness, for example. There are many comorbidities that offer a reversible diagnosis or alternative that could affect memory, such as depression, polypharmacy, obstructive sleep apnea. The fear and Fear of ageism and lack of awareness by the family or patient. A lot of times patients or family may say the patient has been this way all their life and this is just their way of coping or just aging. Long-standing relationships with patients offer longitudinal insights related to progression, comorbidities, and history that uniquely position primary care to take on the lead for this cognitive screening. However, Many lack the skill and resources to do this in a timely fashion, and lack of a simple test is another challenge. As you can see here, early diagnosis and intervention may help reduce the burden of Alzheimer's disease. It increases patient autonomy in their own care decisions. It benefits family and care partners for education, support, and future planning. There is initiation of diagnostic imaging early to figure out where this is coming from or where this is headed. Early intervention, including medications that reduce symptoms and improve quality of life and delayed institutionalization and reduce healthcare costs with better planning. This graph shows that a treatment that is introduced in 2025 that delays the onset of Alzheimer's disease by five years would substantially reduce the burden of Alzheimer's disease throughout the years as you see moving forward. Let's take a look at age-related cognitive decline versus dementia. Typical age-related changes include making a bad decision occasionally, but knowing and being aware of it, learning from your decisions, missing a monthly payment, forgetting which day it is and remembering it later, sometimes forgetting what word to use in a sentence, and losing things from time to time, example, your keys or your phone. Signs of dementia are when these changes or these impairments are more consistent. Poor judgment and decision making, inability to manage your finances, uh, losing track of the date or season, difficulty holding attention in a conversation, and misplacing things and being unable to retrace steps to find them and often paranoia sets in. This is a busy slide, but this shows the importance of embarking into a thorough evaluation for history, physical and workup to find what is reversible, what could be the cause and also trying to plan for the treatment and guide patients through them. In clinic, cognitive testing depends on practitioner preference. It should include attention, orientation, short and long-term memory, language, visuospatial abilities, and executive functioning. In 2018, the American Association for Neurology guidance recommends the use of a brief validated cognitive assessment instrument to assess for cognitive impairment during the annual wellness visit. This is where a lot of patients that do have annual wellness visits regularly can be seen from year to year 
if there are any changes um, that can be picked up and identified early. Currently, the MiniCog screening tool is a validated tool, three minutes, that can increase the detection of cognitive impairment in older adults. It consists of two components, a three item recall test for memory and a simply scored clock drawing test. These are further more comprehensive tests that have been used in daily practice. Um, the most comprehensive being the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It is a 30 question test which takes a little more time that tells whether a person shows signs of dementia in all these domains listed here. The SUMS, which is the St. Louis University Mental Status Exam, also um, is a good test, however, not as comprehensive as the MOCA. The MMSE, or the Mini Mental Status Exam, seems to be the most commonly used in practices, especially primary care, for use in terms of better time and easy to administer. It does screen for cognitive impairment. However, it does not evaluate for executive functioning or capture impairments in ADLs. Oftentimes we have found that the more educated a patient is, the MMSC will be normal for long periods of time, although there are impairments in the patient's functioning. Here are some examples of clock drawings that are abnormal. As you can see, the, one, the clock on the bottom shows good contour, good hours, and a good minute and an hour hand. So does the clock on top, however, is smaller. The other two clocks to the left and to the bottom right are not scorable. So what are the challenge with current tools? While they are easy to administer, it is uncertain whether instruments are administered and scored as intended in routine practice or in routine follow-ups with their annual visits. These tools may be time consuming. They may and often do need a test administrator, which increases the cost without additional reimbursement and increased time. And there is a low inter-rater reliability. Between two test administrators, there could be variances that also occur, which may not be reliable. With digital neurocognitive testing, tools such as BrainCheck are easy to use, simple instructions that are related to the patient with automa automated administration and scoring. It eliminates potential operator bias as seen in paper and pen versions and self-administration or delegated to support staff focusing clinicians on interpretation. A lot of the times clinicians can sit back and watch patients take their tests and monitor anxiety, concentration, body language, attention as they perform these tests. Digital neurocognitive testing is also portable across practice sites and aligns to virtual visits. They can be administered in a virtual fashion right from the patient's home, which increases comfort and ability to perform the test in a comfortable environment such as their home. It offers the ability to focus on the patient in order to gain insights during testing, like we discussed previously. Does the patient display anxiety? Are there any clues that the patient may be more dependent on his or her partner or caregiver for answers? Therefore, we have the ability to look at body language. Is there any evidence of increased frustration or understanding how to go about specific tasks that are assigned to the patient? The cognitive assessments that brain check administers include four domains. Immediate and delayed recall. There are serially 10 words that will be displayed in the beginning and immediately after asking the patient to recall the words as many as possible. The same test will occur at the end of this test, which will then test delayed recognition. 
There is digit symbol substitution, which matches correspondence of symbols to digits, which tests executive function. The stroop, which is finding a matching word and matching the name of a color, which also measures executive function and impulsivity. The trail making test, which is connecting a set of five 25 dots in correct order as rapidly as possible using first only numbers and then using numbers and letters consecutively tests visual attention and cognitive flexibility. So what is the importance of using digital neurocognitive testing? There are many opportunities. There's earlier recognition with the ease of administration, even to the preclinical stage of dementia. There's better monitoring of disease with progression over time, earlier intervention for diagnostic testing and treatment of symptoms, and it is a standardized tool that can be used and administered by multiple practitioners for the same patient in even different locations, removing rater bias. Other opportunities that digital neurocognitive testing do offer are chances to evaluate patients at regular intervals to see if there is worsening decline in memory and in certain domains that are affecting ADLs and IADLs. In this way, polypharmacy and de-escalating therapy becomes very important. Discussing risks and benefits with patients and caregivers in regards to optimizing therapy and increasing quality of care and life at this point in time. Oftentimes, measuring digitally also offers opportunities to expand care into hospice and palliative care options, which may further advance quality of life and support to both the patient and the caregiver. Using digital tools in my practice has helped decrease the time spent on each patient. These tools allow me to administer the cognitive tests virtually from the comfort of their home where I would set up the account for the patient or my staff would do the same. The test would be done at home and the report would be printed out at our office and then interpreted after which we could regroup with the patient or the caregiver to review the results and the interpretation. In person, these tools allow my staff or students to administer the tests without a provider being in the room physically. Providers have the option of also administering the test and interpreting it later. However, it gives a lot more flexibility and options both to the patient and the provider, both in terms of reimbursement and time efficiency to help with diagnosis of cognitive impairment. Oftentimes these digital tools used in primary care settings are the best settings to be used. It is not necessary to be a specialist, although it can be used in specialist settings such as neurology, brain health, geriatrics, etc. But primary care settings are where annual wellness visits or annual physicals occur and these can be employed during these visits. Before the provider would step into the office, therefore allowing for more time efficiency and a report can be generated prior to the practitioner entering the room to review the results as part of the screening evaluations offered at these visits. All in all, Incorporating cognitive testing into annual wellness visits for adults in order to identify cognitive impairment early is important for planning, for referral to a specialist, and once impairment is identified to follow the patient closely at three, six, 12 month intervals to evaluate further and to see if interventions do work. And it is also to integrate digital cognitive assessments into clinical workflow and to remotely differentiate normal aging for precognitive decline to help patients understand their level of impairment and also clinicians monitor them closely for level of impairment.
Again, thank you for joining me today. To receive CME or CE credit, please click on the link and you will be directed to the post-test and evaluation. You can download your certificate upon successful completion. Thank you.